Okay. So what we've all been waiting for is what does it look like through a telescope? But before we turn it over to University of Minnesota Duluth and Jessica Rogers, I just want to take a moment and thank um, everybody, express our gratitude to our many partners around the state who have worked with us to make this virtual statewide star party a success. So thank you to all the organizations around the state who you see mentioned on this slide, who rallied their audiences, their students and stakeholders to join us this week. We are greatly appreciative. So thank you very much. And um, I also want to let folks know that the Bell's free virtual programs like these and the ones throughout the entire week are made possible through the generous support of donors like you. Each time you make a gift of any size, it expands the museum's ability to ignite curiosity and wonder on site and online. If you're interested in making a gift, please visit our website and click join and give at the top of the page. And before we turn it over to our final session this evening, I would like to remind you of our final day tomorrow night. We'll be watching a documentary titled Saving the Dark, starting at seven. And then we have some more family friendly and fun activities to do after that tomorrow night as well. So please uh, join us tomorrow night for our last night of our week long statewide star party. And so now we're gonna turn it over to Jessica Rogers, the planetarium director at the University of Minnesota Duluth Marshall Atworth's Planetarium for their telescope streaming tonight. Hi, Jessica. How are you doing up there in Duluth? Hi, good. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Sorry I was a little bit late. I got here and my Telrad had fallen off of my telescope. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had to align it without a finder scope, which took a little bit longer than planned. Absolutely. Well, uh, what can you see up there from where you are? So we do have some high clouds, but let me, um, see if that is working. Flip the camera. Come on. Can you see it? Well, we can see a very brief outline of you and some lights over your shoulder. So I think we're still looking at the camera that's facing you. Let me. Whatever you did might have done it. Does that work? This can't look, quite tell. It's pretty dark. We might still be looking at you. It looks, for some reason, the screen is looking different than what it did when I tested this. And when I do it. So what if I just share that? Okay, now we can see your mobile device screen. There we go. Oh. So we have got Mars in the camera right now. We do have some high clouds which is why it's not super well defined. Um, but you can still see that cool orange glow to it, which is what I don't think a lot of people realize is that Mars does actually look red to your eye. Why is that, Jessica? Uh, why Mars looks red? Yes, why does it look red to our eye? Because it is actually red. Um, it's covered in uh, basically rust. And that is what gives it that red tone. Try and cut down some of this glare a little bit. There we go, it's a little bit better. I am fighting clouds, which is not giving us a good detailed view. It's a lot clearer tonight than it has been the rest of the week. So that that's exciting that we actually get to see a live shot here through your te telescope. That's true. Let me see. 
So if you are wondering where Mars is in the sky as Jessica adjusts things for us here, it's kind of, it's nice and high in the sky, kind of in the southeast right now. As the night goes on, it'll cross um, our southern part of our sky. It'll be hard to miss, even if you're in the middle of the cities. So how is it different being out in uh, Duluth, Jessica, versus like you're here in the Twin Cities? What do you notice is different about the sky? So I may not be the best person to ask since I haven't really been in the cities. <laughs> Um, from what I've heard, cause I'm, I'm still relatively new to Minnesota, been here for two and a half years, about two and a half years. Um, but unfortunately have only made it down to the cities, I think once in that time. Um, I do know, I mean, you guys have a lot more light pollution, which is going to make the sky brighter than it naturally is. And that drowns out the light of most things in the sky. Up here, because we are not as, as densely populated, uh, we don't have as much light pollution. Um, unfortunately, I am on campus, which is a bit more lit than say even just five minutes outside of downtown. Um, but even then, we can still see some really great views. I mean, we still can see a lot from it. Um, and Mars, like you were saying, is incredibly bright right now. I know, um, Bob told us a little bit earlier about it being at opposition, uh, which is its closest approach to Earth, which is why it is so bright. And it's actually brighter than any of the stars that are around it. So if you just go out and look kind of south-ish, south, southeast right now, that super, super bright, obvious light that's brighter than anything else around it, that's going to be Mars. And now it looks really good. I like what you're doing here because you can actually see uh, the whole like disk of Mars. It doesn't look like a, just a pinpoint of light in the sky. So that's really cool. Yeah, just trying to fight these clouds a little bit. I'm actually going to put on my gloves real quick because it's a little chilly out here. Now, as Jessica puts on her gloves, you don't need telescopes or binoculars to see Mars here. But as you can see, you got see a little bit more detail. It looks like a disc. And so uh, Bob earlier in the evening gave us some recommendations on binoculars or telescopes. Um, so those are some really good equipment just to start off with. But just looking up is is the first step. Jessica, what's what's your favorite thing to look at in the night sky? Oh... It's probably a tie between, you're talking through the telescope or without one? With or without, just your favorite thing. <sighs> probably the Orion Nebula. I don't know what it is about it. So um, for those who may not know, the Orion Nebula is this big gas cloud that is found um, in the region of sky that the Orion constellation is in. It's actually in his sword. It's the uh, middle of the three stars that look like a sword coming from his belt. Um, and that middle star is actually not a star. That's a big gas cloud. And this one is what we call a stellar nursery. It's a, a big cloud of gas that's forming stars. And even with a smaller, oops, where did my camera go? Come on. Okay. <laughs> um, even with a smaller telescope, you can still see the features and stuff. Um, see the like actual, what looks like a cloud of gas and even pick up a little bit of the colors. Um, these really, really pretty pictures that we get out of like Hubble tend to fool people that that's what they're going to see when they look through a telescope. Um, when those are actually, you know, images that may not even be visible light or just lots and lots and lots and lots of images stacked up more light than your eye would receive. And so when you actually look at those things through a telescope, a lot of people 
I've seen actually seem a little bit let down because they're expecting these big, beautiful, colorful things that Hubble shows or that the Hubble images look like. And I think the Orion Nebula is the best one that actually does show that kind of color and vibrancy to it. Um, and I, I really like being able to show that and actually get wows instead of, oh, <laughs> if that makes sense. Oh, I agree with you. The Orion Nebula is also my favorite thing to look at in the sky as well. I was hoping to maybe point over to Pleiades in a little bit, but the clouds are really hogging that area of sky right now. Have you had a chance to look at the Globe at Night app or the Citizen Science Challenge? Sure. I, I need to do that. Okay. So you say there's a little bit of clouds um, up in Duluth. How would you describe your, your seeing? It doesn't seem to be completely cloudy because we can see Mars here, but what would you describe it as? That's one of the things we have to do with this project is describe what are you seeing? How many clouds are there? So I would say it's a pretty thin layer of really high altitude clouds that is a little bit thicker in some areas of the sky. Um, Unfortunately, they seem to be thickest in the areas that I want to look at, which is, you know, kind of what happens. Yeah, it was a little unfortunate that last week was like the great warm week and it was clear skies all week. But Minnesota is very uh, tricky with the weather. And then it went from nice and warm to colder this week with not nearly as many clear skies. So we're, it's something we're always, always battling against here with astronomy. Absolutely. And that is always just kind of the curse of observational astronomy. You are completely at the mercy of the weather. And I know in like my class and stuff, try and get a little bit more detail there. Um, we, we talk about, you know, professional astronomers who have to request telescope time. And most people think of, you know, you, you request this time, everyone gets whatever they want. And if it's cloudy, it's no big deal. You can come back the next night. And that's entirely wrong. Um, there's very, very few time slots for astronomers to use the telescope. And so there's a huge competition, a, a huge, um, I guess competition is the right word, uh, to, to try and gain that time. But then if your night is cloudy, oh well, uh, you're just out of luck and you'll have to wait till the next cycle to try and get some more time. And so like we are so very much at the mercy of the weather but that's why we don't build big professional telescopes in places like Minnesota where we do have you know more cloudy than clear skies I would say on average so we tend to go to places that do have most of their year has very nice clear skies so that you do have a much better chance of actually being able to use the telescope Great points. And it looks like you got some, um, a, a good setting on your phone there, on your phone there, because your camera was capturing some of that red coloration as the clouds let the color come through. Yeah. One of the questions we got through the Q&A box is what camera app are you using on your phone? Uh, it is just my, my straight, the camera app that came with it. Um, most of the cell phone cameras have a either like an auto or a professional mode where you can go in and change settings yourself. Uh, and that's all I'm doing. It's, it's my default camera app that I've put into um, professional mode so that I can play around with these settings. What kind of telescope are you using tonight? Ah, we are using a um, Mead 
LX200, 2000, 200. Um, it is an eight inch telescope. Um, it is, I don't know, how much detail do you want me to get in? That's a good one because a, a, a Mead's a good brand. We have one of those here at the museum as well. Now, are you just holding your camera? I mean, this is a question I get a lot too when people are like, well, how can I take a picture? So are you just holding your camera right up to the eyepiece? I actually bought a little uh, camp cell phone mount that attaches to the eyepiece. So I just uh, attach it on and then it just holds itself there in the eyepiece. And it was like... 15 bucks on Amazon. And so you can just hold it up, but then you're at the mercy of, you know, how steady your hands are. Um, and so something like this lets you get it all set up and then you don't wobble from shaky hands or for something like this, where we want to stay on for a longer period of time, it can just hang out there. Very cool. And as I'm looking at this, I can almost convince myself kind of down at the seven o'clock hour, that might be where the South Pole is. I can sometimes glimpse the little white shiny part there. Yeah, so I would think it's a good shot here. You can also see the kind of towards the where the equator would be that it looks a little bit darker. And Mars does have some darker terrain around its equator. Uh, we have another question about your camera. And um, it says, do you remember the name of the camera mount you got on Amazon for $15? Um, is it pretty easy to use and set up? I don't remember the name. Um, I'm pretty sure I just typed in telescope camera mount. Uh, it was one of the first ones that popped up. Uh, and it is really, really easy. Um, it's just a kind of a screw attachment. Um, that you unscrew it to kind of open up a, a wide section to put over the eyepiece and then you close the screw to kind of clamp it around the eyepiece. Um, once you do that, then there's another screw to kind of adjust exactly where your camera is pointing so that you can get it right over the eyepiece. And then once you're set, you screw it in and you're good to go. Um, I find it fairly easy to use. Um, let me see. Well, that's good to know because one of the questions we get a lot is what's a good telescope? And my basic answer is a good telescope is one that you're going to use. So Absolutely. it sounds like you found a great uh, eyepiece mount because it's useful. It's easy to use. So my wonderful husband who's off uh, helping me with this uh, looked up the, the mount that I bought. It is a, I don't know if it's Goski. G-O-S-K-Y, Universal Cell Phone Adapter Mount. And it looks like it's $19 now, but. Wonderful. Uh, it looks like Bob King is staying on. He's watching and joining us too. So he's, um, he agrees with you. That's a good, that, that's a good mount. We'll put it in the chat for those who are interested. Oh. Yeah. I will say, since we were talking about, you know, what, what telescope to get, um, while I completely agree that the best answer is, you know, whatever you're going to use, I do also like to give the caveat of, but don't buy a cheap $20 one from a department store. Um, because even though the price might be, you know, might, might look nice, they're so flimsy and poorly made that you're just going to get frustrated trying to use it. Uh, and a good quality telescope is really just a couple hundred dollars. Uh, they're a lot cheaper than people might think. But it sounds like Bob kind of talked about that tonight. I had to leave so that I could come up here and get set up. I didn't get to see that part of his talk. He agreed with you. Yeah. He said, just beware of the, the plastic models. Yep. Here's a question that came about Mars that we're still looking at here on screen. 
How bright is it? Can you tell, you know, even a rough estimate of its magnitude or how bright it looks like to our eye? Oh, I'm really bad at doing that. Um, let me think. Maybe about well, one or zero. I'd say between one and zero. Okay, so it's really bright because that's smaller than number. For those of you who um, know a little bit about magnitudes or if this is your first uh, time hearing it, the smaller the number, the brighter the object. So a, a one or a zero, that's pretty bright in our sky right now. Um, a question came in is, why is not Mars not moving in the picture? Oh, that's a good question. So the telescope that I have um, has a motorized mount and a little computer in it. So it actually automatically tracks things for me across the sky. So I don't, once I get it all set up, I don't have to do much of anything other than play with camera settings. Um, I will add, um, while that sounds great, and a lot of people would wanna immediately jump on that, uh, the computerized telescopes are a good bit pricier they also have a, I would, I find a, a kind of semi-steep learning curve to them because in order for it to work correctly, you have to know how to align it so that you can tell the computer, this is where I'm at, this is where I'm pointing, this is the area of the sky, so that it can align the computer and know where it's at and then be able to point from there. Um, so if you're not familiar with the night sky very well, um, this is not a good beginner telescope. It's definitely more of an intermediate to advanced level. Good to know. Another question came in is how red is Mars? That's a good question. I don't quite know how to answer. Um, I would say part of it depends on what's going on on Mars. Because if you have a big dust storm that's going to kind of mute the colors and make it more of a brownish red. Um, but the surface itself, I would say, I mean, it looks like rust. So if you've ever seen rust on metal, that's, that's a good idea of the kind of general color. Yeah, Bob described, described to us a little bit earlier that sometimes those dust storms cover the entire planet. No, it's how we lost poor Oppie. I always get a little sad. Want to go into a little bit more about that? Who is Oppie? So um, Oppie is Opportunity. It's one of the uh, rovers that landed on Mars. I don't remember the date, um, but uh, it and its companion spirit were set to last for, I believe it's 90 Martian days. And they ended up lasting for like a decade, um, roving around Mars. They did some amazing work, traveled super crazy distances all across the planet, um, but they were powered by solar panels. And so when this big dust storm uh, enveloped the planet a couple of years ago, uh, it covered up the solar panels and uh, the batteries drained and it, it was not able to recharge. And so um, Oppie kind of died, which makes me sad. Well, it looks like we got a big band of some thicker clouds coming in. But lasting years, when it was only designed to last 90 days, that's quite impressive. It really was. Now you have things going on up at UMD's planetarium, don't you? Can you describe to us what else you do up there? That's kind of fun. Yeah, um, so we are still currently closed to the public. Um, we, we have not opened back up uh, just because we are a very small dome. Um, we felt the risk is still a little bit too high, but um, we have been doing live streams 
uh, on our Facebook page. We do streams Wednesdays and Saturdays at seven. Uh, and lots of fun stuff, topics change every week. Um, so you can always kind of come check us out on there. And then when we can open back up, we do weekly shows on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. We also have fun special events throughout the year. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a little bit about what we're doing. Um, we're hoping to do some more, because uh, we've done a few telescope streams and we're hoping to do some more, especially coming up here as some of my favorite objects are coming up in the winter sky. Um, that of course is means fighting the cold, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get some not too cold nights that I can come out and do some streams, some telescope streams as well. We have some interest. Um, what is the name of your Facebook page? Ah, so you can find us either through uh, Marshall W. Allworth Planetarium or uh, a little bit easier is UMD Planetarium. Now we've been talking a lot about uh, different types of objects this week in our sky, and we're seeing Mars here, which is awesome. Um, and you mentioned that the Orion Nebula is your favorite thing to see in the sky. Do you have a favorite type of object? Like a, a Tad loves Saturn, he's one of our planetarium staff here at the museum, but also globular clusters are personal favorites of ours because they image so well. Do you have any yeah. favorite types of objects in the sky? I was gonna say, I think globular clusters. Uh, especially uh, the Great Cluster in Hercules, because it just looks like this really pretty shimmering jewel with all of those stars. And yeah, I actually got a really good picture of it on my cell phone over the summer. Um, I'm still really proud of that one, especially since I was with my phone. But um, yeah, I, I would agree. Globular clusters are probably probably up there. Saturn's a close second. We have another question that came in. Is there any sign of living things on Mars? No question mark. <laughs> um, we, we don't have any direct evidence yet. Um, we do know that there was lots of water in the past. And from what we can tell, one of the big things that life needs in order to develop is liquid water. So there is a non-zero chance that some form of life, even if it was just microbes, uh, did develop. And that's a lot of the future missions. I know that's one of the things that Perseverance, the new rover that's landing on Mars beginning of next year, um, is going to be looking for signs of that. Waiting for this cloud band to finish moving so that I can maybe move us over to Pleiades. Well, as we're waiting for the clouds, what are the Pleiades? What would we expect if the clouds do go away? So the Pleiades is a star cluster. Um, so you heard mention of globular clusters. Those are really they're big globs of stars. Uh, astronomers are not always clever when coming up with names for things. Um, and so they're these really kind of densely packed spherical globs of lots and lots and lots of stars. Um, but there's another type of star cluster called an open cluster. Um, and this one's different because it's uh, is fewer stars and they're not as packed as closely together. They're a bit more spread out. And that's what the Pleiades is. This is an open cluster. It is uh, often called the Seven Sisters because with just your eyes in clear dark skies, you can see six to seven bright stars 
Um, you may also see it and think of it as like a little mini dipper because it does kind of look like just a very, very, very small version of the bigger little dipper. Um, but there are actually thousands of stars in it. And so if I can get it on camera, we'll see some of the really bright ones, but we'll also be able to see some of the dimmer ones as well that you can't pick up with just your eye. And if you wanna find it, um, a really, really easy way is if you find Orion, uh, you can use his belt as a pointer. Uh, Cause if you connect the belt in a line and you go, I guess it'll be west across the sky, following the line of his belt, you'll end up seeing this little cluster of stars in the sky and that is Pleiades. We had a few more questions come in. So one is about where you are. How far out in the country are you and how are you connected to the internet for this live stream? So I'm not out in the country. <laughs> um, I am in Duluth. I'm actually at uh, the University of Minnesota Duluth. I am up on the roof of our planetarium. So uh, really kind of more downtown, but because we are a smaller city, that's why we do have some darker skies here. Um, I also have the benefit being higher up on the roof. I'm kind of above a lot of the streetlights and the streetlights all kind of point down. So I have a little bit better viewing than you might have say down in the parking lot. Um, and I'm just connected. Uh, I'm using, not on Wi-Fi. I don't have Wi-Fi up here. I'm just using data on my phone. Okay, so another question came in about Mars. Is Mars smaller or larger than Earth? Smaller. Mars is about half the size of Earth, which is kind of crazy. Oh, my battery is draining faster than I thought it would. Well, I agree with you. We were talking about the Pleiades a little bit earlier on Mars. I think they're both gorgeous sites. Um, and you're right. Uh, that's one of the things that I always kind of um, kind of wish wasn't the case. But as here in the Northern Hemisphere, as the winter stars come up, that's when it gets colder outside. But that's when my favorite things in the sky start to appear, like or the Orion Nebula you mentioned and the Pleiades. Um, so they're just starting to come up over the eastern horizon shortly after sunset. I'm looking forward to things later this winter as well. Yeah, and that's something I've had to adjust to. So um, I am originally from South Carolina. So our winters aren't anything like the winters up here. Uh, and so those were actually really nice nights to go out um, because it wasn't really, really hot, but it also didn't get very cold either. And so the winter was my favorite time to go out observing um, which is part of probably why I have such a fondness for a lot of things in the winter sky. Um, but I've definitely had to adapt to that moving up here in Minnesota. Um, it's it's not, not as easy or as, as nice to go out in the winter nights. Definitely have to bundle up and grab hand warmers, absolutely. I think I'm going to attempt Pleiades. Okay. We're going to sit in anticipation. It's one of my favorites. So as Jessica moves the telescope, the Pleiades are that open star cluster she was describing to us. And they are in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. So Taurus has a very bright eye, Aldebaran. It's a nice bright red star. It's not quite quite as bright or as red as Mars here in our sky, but it definitely has a little bit of color to it. And it comes out like a giant V. Um, and that V shape, you can imagine, are the, the bull's horns. And the Pleiades are just off to the shoulder, a little bit off to the west of those horns of Taurus the bull. 
So this, these things will be rising a bit further east than Mars tonight if you're looking out in the sky or if you happen to have a star map. Um, take a look at Taurus the bull over in the eastern sky. That's where we're going to try to look at. And if anybody is a car enthusiast, uh, the Pleiades in Japanese are known as Subaru. So if you've ever looked at the logo of a Subaru car, they have stars on it after this open cluster, after this object in space. So there's actually astronomy all around you, even if you didn't know it was there. <gasps> and I see some stuff coming into view. Great job, Jessica, you did it. Yep, there it is. I'm going to try and just get as much of it as I can. And then I can play around with settings to make it. A little bit better. So one of the nicknames of the Pleiades here are the Seven Sisters. But you said it's an open cluster and there's thousands of stars. Do you have any idea why it might be nicknamed the Seven Sisters if there's more than seven stars? Uh, Cause that's what's visible to your naked eye is six to seven bright stars. And so for, you know, all of the cultures who lived before us without telescopes, that's what they saw was this little tight knit group of seven stars. Uh, and so a lot of the cultural stories um, are stories involving this little cluster from all over the world. Most of them involve the number seven because of that. So you can see this even without a telescope. Absolutely. And even with some, you don't have to have super dark skies to see it either. Uh, you can see it with uh, a little bit of light pollution in your skies. Can I tell one of my favorite stories? Go for it. I'd love to hear it. Okay. Um, so... Ooh, I am so sorry. My battery is draining fast. Um, we'll do what we can. Okay. So my favorite comes from the Mono Native American tribe. And this involves uh, seven wives who were out in the woods, uh, just kind of walking around. They got a little bit hungry. So they stumbled across some wild onions. And they decide to sit, have a little snack. Uh, and then they get back, uh, they, they get done, they head home to their husbands and they go to, you know, kiss their husbands hello after they've come back from their little walk. And the husbands all kind of recoil from all of their wives because they have stinky onion breath. And so they send all of the wives out of the houses because they don't want to smell the stinky onion breath. And so the wives all leave and are really, really sad and upset about this and decide, you know what, who needs them? And climb up into the sky to live forever together with their stinky onion breath. Um, but then the husbands um, end up really missing their wives and they climb up in the sky to uh, chase after them. And that's actually the V of the head of Taurus the bull is the husbands going after the wives, which are the stars and Pleiades. I had never heard that story. I like that one. Who doesn't yeah. like a good onion? Onion rings or like sauteed oh. onions on something. Those are delicious. I agree. But, uh, yeah, and, uh, stars have been used throughout history in many different cultures. And so when we're looking at the stars, I, I like to appreciate that people have done this for so long and then kind of being a part of that history and a part of those observations that they made either recently or way back when, depending on um, what culture you're talking about. Absolutely. So I, I love hearing the connections to other people and places. And we always like sharing more than just the Greek stories, because uh, the Greek stories are the ones that most people know. If they've heard any, they've heard the Greek stories. But the Greeks aren't the only ones who, who use the stars to tell stories. And so we always like to try and, and mix it up and give a lot of different cultural perspectives, um, which also just makes it feel more of a sense of community, knowing just how many people, and I'm dead. Well, we got some good views there, Jessica. Cool. 
I'm gonna have to log on. No, you got, you got some really good views there while the battery lasted. So I appreciate that. Um, are there any other questions that anybody's dying to know about our sky above us tonight? If you do, please use the question answer box and we'll get to as many questions as we can. We are running close to the end of our time here tonight, but I don't leave anybody hanging. If there's something you're dying to know, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I do want to say that uh, we greatly appreciate everybody who is tuning in tonight and who has throughout the week. And we were lucky enough tonight to get uh, mostly clear skies here. We saw Mars and the Pleiades. Um, and we want to know that I want you to know that the Bell's free virtual programs are made possible through the generous support of donors like you. And please consider making a gift of any size by visiting our website and clicking join and give at the top of the page. Um, I also wanna thank uh, participants from today's broadcast um, and the previous week. And we greatly appreciate things that are going on behind the scenes. There's many people that work on this to bring these events to you. And tomorrow is the last night of our week long virtual statewide star party. We're going to kick off tomorrow with Saving the Dark Watch Party. It, we're going to watch a documentary about uh, night skies and keeping our skies dark so we can appreciate those views that sometimes go missing a little bit when we get a lot of light pollution. We're also going to use sketching. We're going to go through an activity um, with Jerry Jones, who is part of the um, Minnesota Astronomical Society. He's the Astron or Astronomical League coordinator. And we're going to see how sketching just the act of putting pencil or pen or crayon to paper can actually help you develop skills and observation. Maybe you'll see more in the night sky than you thought was there by practicing your observing or practicing sketching. You don't even have to be a good artist. I'm certainly not. We'll also talk with Meredith Weber um, and Andrew Cern um, tomorrow. Uh, they're two of the planetarium staff here at the Bell Museum. They're both undergraduate students at the University of Minnesota, and they're working on some really cool projects. Um, and so they're going to show us a little bit about what they've been working on as part of their studies and internships. And then we'll wrap up tomorrow night and the week with live telescope observing from here at the Bell Museum. Cross your fingers that it's clear skies tomorrow night. Um, we're, we're ready for it, whether it's clear skies or not, but tomorrow night will be a fun night. So it looks like there's just a few questions that came in and we do have just a few more minutes, so I'll try to get to them here. Um, one of them is why is Jupiter's red spot red? Well, the different colors of um, outer space, if you will, the different colors of our planets actually come from the different materials that are making up their atmospheres. And so Jupiter has a lot of hydrogen and helium, but it also has some ammonia in it. And now I don't remember exactly which um, element or which um, gases that make it quite red, but it's the different clouds, the different um, chemical makeups that have the great red spot or have the white bands of clouds or the darker kind of orangish brown colors there too. Uh, my favorite planet is actually Uranus and it has this nice kind of soft blue color to it because of the methane in its atmosphere. So I don't remember off the top of my head which gas gives the red spot its color, but that is a clue as to what it's made out of. Um, what's coming up on our docket? Yes, uh, this is another good question. Similar virtual events here coming up in um, the rest of the year. Bob King, let us know today what some things you are that are in the night sky that you can look forward to on your own. But here at the Bell Museum, we do have several virtual events uh, coming up as well. So we're not going to leave you hanging. We're going to come and be right there with you. We have tomorrow night, uh, um, obviously, our wrap-up of this week. But the, in December, we'll also have our December monthly star party. So we'll be right back here sharing our, our views of our sky with you. But then we have several online Facebook live events scheduled as well. So we aren't, we aren't going anywhere. We are a museum without walls or with a museum that goes beyond just the four walls of our physical building. And we'll be online with you all month and into 2021 as well. So we're not going anywhere. We hope that you come back and join us as well. Lots to look forward to. Uh, another question came in from Henry. Um, how do comets blast off? Well, that's a great question. Now, comets are, you can think of as big, slushy, dirty snowballs in space. 
And we're getting to winter with a bunch of snow on the ground. So it's actually a perfect time. You can make your own model of a, of a, of a comet. So comets are a big, um, big slushy, dirty snowball in space. So you have the snow, you have ice, and it's really packed together. But it's also covered in dirt, kind of like uh, the dirt that would be on the road that like, ice melts or the dirt that comes from your flower beds um, when it's there. So it's this big, really tightly packed um, ice, ice ball. Well, everything in space is moving. There is no up or down or left or right. Everything in space is just moving because of gravity. And sometimes the comet will get a little nudge from something nearby, and it'll come flying into um, our solar system closer to the sun. And when an ice ball heats up or gets heated up, that ice starts to melt, and it'll actually evaporate, creating those comet tails trailing behind it. We had a comet visit our night skies this past summer, Comet Neowise. That was near the Big Dipper this past summer, like in July. Now, it's coming in closer to the sun because of the sun's gravity. And so everything in space is always moving, and gravity is the main factor out there. Um, and so that's how comets, they're not really blasting off, but they're going through space because they're being attracted by gravity of another large object out there like our sun. Okay, so another question came in, um, thinking the constellation of the Seven Sisters also looks like some stars for the horse and three stars for the man, a man riding a horse. Absolutely. Now, the, there's many stories that go along with the Pleiades and that group of what looks like six or seven bright stars to our naked eye or um, many stars if you look at through binoculars or a telescope. Uh, some people would say it looks like a mini dipper because we already have the big dipper and the little dipper, so maybe it's a mini dipper. Some people I've said, I've heard say it looks kind of like a little cocktail glass. And so you definitely use your imagination when we're looking out there. And the Pleiades, those seven sisters, are part of the constellation of Taurus the bull. So you definitely go and take a look at, at it and use your imagination. Okay, another one came in. Why isn't Halley's Comet evaporating? Well, comets do evaporate. That's what those big, huge tails are stretching behind them. So once they fly past the sun, they heat up and some of their material evaporates off, but not all of it. And in their orbits, they'll go flying back out to the outer edges of our solar system and they'll cool back down and refreeze. And so some comets have orbits that make them come back time and time again. And so that's what Halley's is doing, is that it's coming by, some of it's evaporating as it goes around the sun and it gets uh, way back out and goes orbiting out path, out towards the outer edge of our solar system again and comes back and loops back around the sun and it keeps going back. And it's about, if I'm remembering right, about 76 years it takes to do one full orbit of that comet. So it does slowly evaporate and eventually it probably will disappear because all of its materials have evaporated. But great question. And those comet debris, that's what's creating those meteor showers that Bob King shared with us um, earlier this evening, looking out for the Leonids and the Geminids later coming up this year. Um, will Neowise come back again? And if so, when? You know what? I'm not quite sure how, if, um, how long it, its orbit is predicted to be or if it's even on a closed orbit where it's going to come back. Some comets fly past the sun once, they go back out into space, and they never uh, return again. So each orbit is slightly different, and I'm not quite sure about Neowise, if it's going to come back or not. Uh, can we see the Orion Nebula with binoculars? Yes. So it's going to look like a little uh, dark smudge in the sky just below the three stars of Orion's belt. It is hanging in his sword there. Um, but you can see it with binoculars, absolutely. So find his belt, the three stars in the, in the row for the belt, and then hanging off it, that area where that looks like be a middle sword, middle star of its sword, that is where you should look to find the Orion Nebula. That's actually the picture behind me here. This picture behind me is from the Hubble Space Telescope, but that's what it looked like through Hubble with all the colors swirling around. It'll look just like black and white uh, kind of swirls here through binoculars or a telescope. Our telescopes aren't quite powerful enough to pick up all these gorgeous colors here. But that looks like the end of the questions that have come in. And so I do want to say thank you so much, everybody, one last time for joining us tonight. And thank you again for all of our partners. Uh, check out our website for resources and activities like the one D led us through this evening. Um, reading books, a reading list for both adults and kids are also on our website, like the Ely Public Library went through with us tonight. And so we hope you have a wonderful weekend. There's lots to do in the sky. And the best, I think, sites are coming up this winter. So there's lots to look forward to. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you tomorrow.